Hi, welcome to another episode of Law and Politics. I'm Sheriff Michael Bellotti, your host today. We are definitely in a different setting uh, than typically you see us at from uh, your homes. We, are, we have the, uh, the good fortune of being with David Brednoy, who is a uh, nationally syndicated and uh, most importantly, Boston uh, radio personality and talk show host on Radio 1030 WBZ. And not a prisoner. And not a prisoner. At the moment. Although you have been. I have been uh, in your jail. Uh, sure. We've had you, uh, you incapacitated at the jail before. Uh, this is uh, David's home. He's opened up to us. This is also where he does his radio show uh, probably two-thirds of the time, half the time. Four, uh, four or five nights a yeah. week. Four many of, many of you know David Brednoy as, uh, as the thinking man's talk show host. That's what I hear. Been in radio for how many years now? It's, uh, it's coming up to the end of the 29th year, actually. Is it? Yeah, and, and I'm going to keep doing it till I get it right. <laughs> Can you tell um, us, David, just for those folks at home who they hear you every night, and, and you do make references, but you know about where you grew up. We know where you went to Harvard, and at what point in your kind of developing years, or maybe professional years, you decided to end up in radio. Sure, I, I grew up in Minneapolis and went to Yale as an undergraduate, and then to Harvard as a graduate student. And then I taught for a while in Texas and came back here and taught at Northeastern University and BC and a few other places while working on my doctorate. And I was asked to, to be a commentator on Channel 2 in the early 70s. And that led to working at Channel 7. And then that led to radio. And so doing it sort of thing, well, this will be fun for a while. Started radio part-time in 1975 and full-time in 1976. And what I thought would be a, a while has become the bulk of it. So half of my life I've been in radio or television, and there doesn't seem to be any end to it unless they throw me out the door. Well, that, well, that happens periodically. What, what, what is your concentration in terms of studies, undergrad and uh, doctorate? I, I majored in Japanese at uh, college and in Oriental languages and, and literature and history and uh, so on at uh, Harvard. And then when I came back to graduate school, I, I switched to American history. So I got a final degree, a doctorate in American history. And there aren't too many Japanese majors <laughs> doing talk radio in Boston, <laughs> no, no. who also majored in Norwegian in high school. Now there's a combo. Did That's you really? useful Norwegian is in That's Boston. Right. My grandfather was born in Norway. Wang, really? W-A-N-G, yeah. I thought Bilotti was, yep. that's a part of the that's that's southern part of, ah. Yep, Wisconsin farmers. Uh, but, uh, well, there we are. You enough see, about me. Enough. Where we, <laughs> so, at what point did, you be, did it become clear to you radio was going to be your, you know, your calling or your career well, or profession? Well, in many ways it was inadvertent in that I, I was actually aiming mainly to teach. And the point was that I didn't want to leave. I love Boston and I didn't want to move to Guam. I remember being offered a job in Guam. So I looked at a map and I said, ah, well, where do you go for a weekend in Guam? Well, I guess you go to Guam. And I thought, no, this is ridiculous. So I took the radio thing and the TV thing and said, well, this will be temporary. And it just, after a while, became permanent, and the, tele and the, and the teaching became part-time. It's more, it's more involving with me now that I've, I've taken on full duties at Boston University, but for a long time, uh, radio was the major part of my life, and teaching only a very small part. Now they're sort of equal in terms of the amount of time that I spent doing mm -hmm. each of them, and, and each has its advantages. I love the give and take with actual human beings in class. I can look at them, there they are. Radio, you're talking with people, they talk back at you. And TV as tonight, we, we hope people are watching us, and if not, you could arrest them and give them a hard time. But uh, you don't get that, that back and forth with, uh, with television. So I like all three approaches to communicating with people, radio, TV, and, and teaching, primarily radio and teaching. You know, because you didn't really set out to be a radio personality, a talk show host, uh, early on as you were you know, going through your studies, uh, I wonder, did you have a mentor? Well, not, a, not so much a mentor, but somebody that you wanted to emulate or, or admired or saw as, you know, as the kind of... Uh, in the, radio, you know. Yes, in radio. Well, I learned a lot from a variety of people. One of them was Chris, uh, the late Norm Nathan, who I was at three stations with, uh, HDH, which is no longer a radio station, RKO and, and BZ. He was at all of those, and he'd been at for a long time. He gave me some very good hints on how to do things. Lavelle Dyant gave me a couple good hints too long ago. And, and Jerry Williams, with whom I worked for a long time at, at uh, WRKO. Now, and someone like Jerry, if I, and Jerry, Jerry, please. Provocative, understood oh. it was entertainment, had his political beliefs, yes. uh, seemed to pick some issues and stuck with them like a seatbelt. 
uh, law and different things. He was and, like a terrier. And people don't know he was he was considered a, a liberal in the seventies, wasn't yeah. he, in terms of the Vietnam yeah, War? I think what you might say that he moved uh, along a spectrum depending upon the issue that you would have identified him as quote liberal early on, but but later on in, in time he became more libertarian in some ways and conservative. Right. I think any uh, thoughtful individual goes with issues rather than with a label, even though dem a Democratic or Republican stalwart will usually say, well, my party is right on virtually everything, and your party is wrong on virtually everything. But I think the ordinary person feels more comfortable going with whatever the matter at hand is and determining where he stands on those matters on the basis of what he thinks is right, which is why we have people who vote uh, for maybe a Republican governor, as has happened with with Governor Romney, but for Democratic people for Congress. You know that this year in a few weeks, all the incumbent Democrats are going to win, no question. <laughs> uh, you're a, dem a Democratic chair, <laughs> and I don't think that you probably have to face blood, sweat, and tears every time you want to run for election. It's a Democratic state right. with aberrations. I'm one of those aberrations. <laughs> I'm the libertarian guy who people actually tolerate. Are you officially a civil libertarian? Uh, well, a libertarian uh, party member, I definitely are. Civil really, libertarian yeah. is a small small c, small l. A lot of people, both uh, Republicans and Democrats, are civil libertarians in the sense that they want you know, all of our freedoms retained and at the same time we're not anarchists, we don't want no government, right. and we want to maintain whatever balance there is between security, especially now following 9-11, and our, our liberties. And civil libertarians tend to be people who want to make sure that we don't get so enthusiastic about the law, with all due respect, the that we government. cast away the rights of right. prisoners. And it, you as a sheriff obviously want to treat your prisoners well, and at the same time your duty is to protect the citizenry from bad guys. So you can be both a civil libertarian and right. a law enforcement person. Definitely. It's not a contradiction in uh, terms. Somebody who I grew up listening to was Gene Burns, who I always considered a uh, libertarian. Definitely. Gene, Gene and I got to know each other at RKO. And he does, on the West Coast, a KGO, a program very similar to mine. He's very successful there, he's a great guy. And I would say that on issues, probably we are more in sync than I am with anybody else in radio. And that basically our theme is smaller government, less, intru uh, less obtrusive and intrusive bureaucracy, rights of the individual, and at the same time, sanity. Neither Gene nor I want to say, open the doors, come one, come all, illegal aliens, flop in from wherever and do what you want. We're not, we're not lunatics about that, right. at least I, I think we are not. Gene is also such a quality guy, He's such an honest and decent and good guy, and he got a great voice. Yeah. I would drool for that I have no voice. idea what he looks like, but I remember he had this He's kind of presence. He's a very large guy. Room. He has, he has a, a certain amount of, of um, um, arthritis, and so it's hard for him to move. He's physically not handicapped, in that he can't move. But he's not, you're not going to go out and play a, a game of catch with him, as opposed to me, a major right. athlete type. Well, that's a joke. But now, Gene, Gene, Gene triumphs over the fact that his physical disabilities keep him from being a swiftly moving guy, but the brain is absolutely 100% He was working. quite a personality. He always led it to Jerry Williams. Yeah. Uh, Let's talk about the media in, in this perceived bias. You yeah. know, up, up until uh, a few years ago, uh, you, you had the CNNs of the world, uh, public radio, et cetera. And it seems like at least, maybe it existed in other areas, but now you see Fox Network in a more conservative bent. Uh, Rush Limbaugh, who has taken a, uh, you know, a market share. Uh, a very significant market share, yeah, it, uh, definitely. Obviously, there is such thing as a bias, but right. to what degree? Uh, well, it's, it's a complex question. I would say this, that obviously people who give opinions for a business have to have a bias. Right. It would be pointless to come on and say, hi, I have no opinion on anything. I'm just a piece of soft dough. <laughs> right. That does not uh, make uh, for a good radio program. And so people like uh, uh, Rush and me and others, we have our points of view. Some are more partisan in that they're wedded to one party more than others. And some people like me are less partisan and that I'm not wedded to one of the major parties, but we take positions and we should. With the, the question of bias is whether people who affect to be neutral, like the TV anchors really are, certainly it's very difficult to regard Dan Rather anymore as what he would have us believe he is without a bias. He'd spend time at a Democratic fundraiser and said, oh, I didn't even know it was that well. Right. And certainly this, this getting his teeth into these documents, which didn't pan out as authentic, 
when he said just a few weeks earlier when the Swift Boat Veterans for Truth, so-called, came out with their charges about Senator Kerry back in his Vietnam days, he said, oh, this is meaningless. This is as old as the Napoleonic Wars. Pooh pooh to that, 30 years old. The minute the charges came up once again that Bush may have missed his physical exam on his birthday in the National Guard, a hideous act of, of terrible disloyalty, then rather wanted to spend the rest of his life hanging on to that and saying these documents we know are true and so on. He had a producer, Mary Mapes, who spent five years trying to catch Bush right. in regard to the National Guard. You can't call that neutral. And, that and is it's bias. not so much how they report something, it's what they do deem important to report on, Precisely, yeah. and it's the issue they bring to the attention. You know, you can sit on both sides of the issue and say, well, that was fairly objective. Right. But it's the fact that they're reporting on this particular issue. And uh, do you, and not to get into Dan Rather's mind, but do you think they really think they have a bias, or at some point do they become so kind of convinced of their position? I think probably psychologically they have to feel that they are straight down the line. Now, obviously not on every issue is every person of, of a political bent going to skew the news. But it seems to me that you made the, the remark a, a minute ago, uh, which stories will they cover? Well, the choice of what story is worthy of being in the first few minutes or the last few minutes or not at any minutes of the evening news would in some sense reflect the feeling of the anchormen, who are also the managing editors of those programs, that this is important. and. It would seem to me, if you look very carefully over a long period of time at ABC, NBC, CBS's evening news, you will find a lean in a democratic and liberal direction. Fox irritates liberals because they don't want to acknowledge that they have basically the, the best of, of everything else. The New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the, the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, the major newspapers and the major TV networks are all liberal in their orientation. Welcome to it. Be honest about it. And when Fox comes along and has talk hosts who are more conservative, liberals scream, oh my gosh, isn't this horrible? They're biased, the media are all run by conservatives and so on, or they'll mention some of the talk hosts on radio. Granted, that uh, demographic tends to lean conservative. No question, the talk radio, largely because liberals have no sense of humor. And right. And simply can't you wonder if the liberal, half this stuff is tongue in cheek. It's just tongue people. in cheek. The way they, yeah. they do their morning shows, it's, it's, it's relaxed. They're sitting like this, uh, a little bit provocativeness. And, uh, but is it tongue in cheek? I mean, they're getting a kick out of ribbing you know, the establishment, the, the fourth estate. I, I think they do. You have to see the new movie that's just opened called Team America. It's all marionettes. A bunch of gung ho American guys go out to fight the Islamic terrorists. Along the way, they actually bring down the Eiffel Tower and the pyramids and so on, because we're not very good at, at aiming. But the main villains are the Hollywood glitterati. And they shoot the head off of Michael Moore, and they eviscerate uh, Matt Damon, who's an idiot in the movie, and Alec Baldwin, and Helen Hunt, and Susan Saran Rapp, and that whole pile <laughs> of lefty goo-goos. And Kim Jong-il is, of course, the leader of terrorists, and he feeds Hans Blix to his shark. Wonderful scene. It's all done with oh, marionettes. Yeah, yeah. There's also marionette sex in this movie, and it almost got an NC-17 rating. Now, talk wow. about a cuckoo society in which you give a rating of inappropriate for anybody because you have some pieces of wood having sex. You don't see, you don't a, see a lot of those type of films you don't, as a no. kind of counterbalance. Right, and I'll tell you, it is so funny, and it just oh, absolutely skewers the left. It, it, Thankfully, it, it, something to, to counterbalance that Michael Moore's scrofulous. It must be tough to be not a lefty. In Hollywood. Yeah. You watch, watch what happens at an Oscar thing where they announce something like, um, oh, Charlton Heston. Right. You know, and then Michael Moore comes on. They're screaming with yeah. glee. They can't even bring themselves to, to treat with the so same weren't, decency. So weren't these people middle Americans who, you know, went to Hollywood, who, you know, kind of lucked out or used some of their talents? You know, if, if, what happens to these celebrities once they get to Hollywood? It's the water. It's the water. Yeah, no, I think, I think, I think <laughs> that they, they're basically very stupid people, and they buy into the ideology of the right. left, which is, in general, idiotic. And they're the and ones they, that embrace them probably yeah, the most. And, you know, who's going to speak up? Let's say you're a new hotshot young starlet, or a new upcoming young, young would-be, a, a Brad Pitt. And are you likely to have a fundraiser for Arnold Schwarzenegger or for... Uh, George Bush, when knowing that nobody then will speak to you thereafter, and producers right. will hire you. You know, the most powerful people in Hollywood are, are great movie makers. Uh, 
like Steven Spielberg and powerful performers like Barbara Streisand. These people are talented without question, but the only people they admire and the only people they hang around with are other lefties. Right. And so consequently, when someone like Mel Gibson comes along with his most recent movie, it drives them insane. And you wonder if the system's going to turn on him eventually. You know, you know, that's... Well, uh, I'll tell you, the nice thing about this movie, Team America, is they all get blown to bits. That's good. Cut their heads, cut off. The whole thing is very nice. And, and oddly, I saw it in a screening the other night, and with a lot of kids, you know, the kind of college kids that watch South Park, I'm not sure they quite got the point, but they were wildly <laughs> gleeful about it. At the end, I asked a couple, I said, you realize, of course, that your lefty heroes are being blown? Yeah, man, but dude, that's fun. You know, I don't but care. But what's funny about it, as you said, is they're so humorless about themselves at times. You know, the Alec Baldwin's, the Barbara Streisand's. Oh, they're so sanctimonious. That when so somebody much. finally, uh, you know, there's a parody. The movie's going to be a very big success. Yeah, it'll probably grow kind of word of mouth and then become something uh, even yeah, bigger we'll than a cult following. We'll see how the viewers deal with it because uh, the movie reviewing business is the most left-wing of all journalism. There are two non-lefty journalists who are movie reviewers in America. Michael Medved and guess who? The rest are all <laughs> lefties. And, and you know, they, they simply fall into the trap of adoring something like Michael Moore's horrifying movie, which is just a compendium of lies. They let their ideology get in the way of it. Read movie reviews sometimes and see how they overdo the enthusiasm for left-wing causes. Right. And, and their whole ability to be a, a critic of the art takes second place often to their ability to speak on behalf of their ideology. So in, in a sense, it's kind of fun being a libertarian and not a lefty uh, in, in Boston in that I get to be basically loathed by everybody. You do, but, but, but everybody about. respects you. That's, <laughs> that's right. Uh, let's talk about the media coverage of the debates. Sure. Okay. Uh, these Bush-Kerry uh, debates. It's amazing for me. It's just, you know, yeah, granted I'm elected official, but a bit of a lay person when it comes to this national politics and the media to watch the spin. Uh, from the minute the debate's over uh, to the next 10 hours, to the next 36 hours, and then, you know, the re-spinning and the re-spinning and, you know, the, the, the fact-checking. What do you think? Is this a healthy thing? I, I think it's, it's good <coughs> that we have the confrontations. I wish they were really debates, several hours in which uh, Bush and Kerry would talk with each other without a moderator and would see what happened. Now, people say, well, Kerry would do better. Well, I said, well, the point is not to pick a, a, a forum that advantages one or the other but a form in which you can let them think on their feet and talk about things at greater length. But nonetheless, we do learn a few things. We learn body language. You learn the ability of Bush not to really have enough material to get through the first debate. He kept repeating the same stuff. Kerry is much better as a debater. But after the first debate, the Democrats did something pretty dumb and pretty obvious. They sent out hundreds of emails uh, pretending to be from ordinary people, sending things off to people like me, but you look at the address, California, Colorado, people have never heard my program. They say things like, boy, I used to be a Republican, but that Kerry, boy, did he impress me. He's our man. And they emerged, some of them came even before the debate had begun. So stupid was the Democratic So they're trying to change they're the opinion to, leaders. They're trying to, and exactly. And who among opinion leaders wouldn't know a phony email from one that came from a regular listener? The listener listened to me and said, David, I heard your program the other night. You're talking with Sheriff Bellotti, and I watched the debate tonight. I think Kerry's great. That's a real email, and I right. respond to that. But I got so like a form letter. of these within a couple hours after the first encounter. And uh, evidently, according to political consultants, the Democratic establishment sent this out across the board. Even the Globe got caught publishing two of these letters and didn't realize they'd been spammed. Wow. After the vice presidential and the second presidential encounter, it was a much smaller number of these things. But again, you, you can tell the difference between a real email directed to a real person whom they actually listen to and something like that. So that, to me, is a desperation move by the Democrats. Now, I've never received that before from any party, ever, anything like it's that. It's as if they thought they were taking it to the next step. And it's funny, you know, the closer you get to an election, the more crazy you know, occurrences you see. Oh, yeah. You know, they think they can, they can get away with more. Well, uh, for one thing, they want to f feel, I guess, if they say it strongly enough, loud enough, and often enough, that will change our mind. I mean, have there been instances where the media has kind of bought into this manipulation I, over the years, would you say, in I, terms I, of presidential elections or even 
on issues of the day? I think there's a tendency to assume that the polls are so accurate that they can guess what they're doing. Remember 2000, just four years ago, how the election occurred. Uh, Florida was called first for Gore, then oops, it's for Bush, and then oops, it's for Gore. And the, the point was that they were in such a rush right. to call it. I wish that we would do away with exit polls and, and wait until every poll in America, including Hawaii, is over and then begin that for coverage. Right. I wish we'd do that. Because we know that the, the people in the panhandle of Florida tend to be more conservative. Many of them didn't go to the polls because what they heard was that Gore had won. And um, that, the same thing happened in the um, Carter-Reagan election of, of, eight, of 1980. Many people out in the West just didn't bother to go to the polls. Therefore, many of their congressmen lost because the election was called so early for Reagan that many people said, well, there's not much point going out and voting for uh, Carter. He's going to lose. And meanwhile, they didn't vote for their congressman or their Democratic challenger. And so the polls and the media spin, the need to be there first, I think gets in the way of democracy. I don't want to stifle the media, but I wish that they would agree not to report the election till everyone has voted. They love to crawl it, though. They, 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 they love to beat you to the yeah. punch. And, you know, we'll do the same thing. We'll be sitting there on Tuesday <laughs> night at the station. It's amazing. Be, you know, a take a deep breath, wait three hours, but people want to know. Yeah, you know, it's within, like gossip. within <laughs> seconds after the polls. They need to know. Closed, I think I can safely predict, you can take this to the bank, that Massachusetts will vote for John Kerry. <laughs> I, I think I'm we willing, have to, wait I'm to, willing any, to uh, bet your mortgage on the that The question one. is the margin. Let's talk about a couple of Boston personalities. Howie Cap, his role in the media. Um, I worked with Howie at Channel 7. I like him personally. He's a lot fun. He's a much more gentle guy when you're just talking with him. When he gets before a microphone, something bites him. There's a little toxin in there. Yeah. It's the he, he, he toxin, <laughs> in which he likes to make fun of people. He's very bright. I think in some ways he may be losing his edge in that he's gotten so comfortable just going with the straight Republican line on everything that he's lost the um, ability that he has. I know he's a very bright guy. To, uh, to take issue by issue. And in some, in some way, I think it's showing in the, in the ratings, which he's not doing as well as, as he used to. But there's no doubt about how he's intelligent. And I like him personally. I'm glad we're not opposite each other, though if we were, I would be right. severely. And he seems to tag at the baby boomers occasionally. He brings in these, these former celebrities from the 70s shows. Uh -huh. He knows what he's trying to develop. Where, you know, you wonder if Jerry Williams was still in that slot. Uh, Jerry had a way of kind of, as you said, grabbing an issue and staying with it. Yes. Do, do people care about issues any longer in government? They, they care they, about As some. they did 20 years ago. You, you don't want to become a nuisance, though. You don't want to become, oh, there he goes again. Right. In other words, we have our points of view, and ultimately, if you get the same question, you're going to give the same answer. But there are times when you want to say, you know, I've dealt with this so much. Could we move on to something else? And the frustrating thing is that oftentimes the, the caller who has had no reason necessarily to have heard me or Howie or Jay Severin or anybody talk about an issue in the past on this, says, well, explain it to me again. Again. Right. And uh, there are times when I want to say, gee, I wish you could just sort of read the collective me, but I don't <laughs> have the collective me, so I can't give it to them. I think that people want to move with the issues of the moment rather than have a continual reiteration of whatever was of interest before. During elections, everything begins to squeeze into one central issue, and that is, of course, which one should win. For instance, we, we at, our, at our station do it. I think people are wise are doing everywhere. We're, we're doing fewer and fewer programs on anything but election-related matters, not to the 100% exclusion of anything else, but it would be pretty silly, for instance, the night before the election, right. to do something on, on whether or not the, the sap is running properly in the <laughs> maple trees. You know, you, you, you play with the reality of the time. And the day after it's over. At the day after You'll be looking at new topics. Oh, how could this have happened? Oh yeah. my gosh. Oh golly whiz. I I people want to talk about politics. Maybe they will. I don't know. I gotta tell you in two thousand there were fewer people that called the program before the election than called during the thirty seven day Florida Follies of the yeah, right. In other words, the interest level in two thousand was the lowest I'd ever seen it in a presidential election. But as soon as we knew that we didn't know who won then it became fascinating. Let me ask you about another media personality sure. who has uh, you know, had a few ups and downs, but was certainly one of the, uh, 
the more respected columnist in this in this city in this state for a number of years, sure. uh, Mike Barnacle. Sure. You know, he, he seems to be uh, rebuilding himself with in terms of credibility and trust. He's re rebuilt himself very very uh, well. Uh, people know Mike and I are very tight friends. We've been very close since 1990 when we worked together. Uh, during a brief period, we did some coverage of the election of that year, and then Channel 5 put us on in, in a point-counterpoint thing. Got to know each other. He's a very, very dear friend of mine, and, and uh, I'm glad for him. He's having fun both writing his column in the Herald, writing his column in the New York Daily News, and doing a radio program. Uh, on WTKK that he, he admits he doesn't do a terrible amount of preparation for. <laughs> he appears, he talks, and he goes home. And he also does Chronicle. And he's got great kids and a wonderful wife. And he's a very, very happy guy. He said to me one occasion, he said, I'm doing less actual labor than ever before, but so making more money. He, I, I, he I must, have, he must have had some built up capital there in terms of after he went through to have some key people stand by him and allow him to kind of take the. Uh, you know, the rebuilding route. Well, the, the thing at the Globe was so much overplayed. It was, it was such an exaggeration of errors. Uh, one of the things that people said, oh my gosh, he's borrowing from George Carlin. Well, you know, the jokes are jokes. And I've got to tell you, as one who's written columns for 40 years, once in a while you write the same column. Because how many opinions do you have on abortion? <laughs> right. and, and Mike found himself on occasion repeating stories uh, in his column that basically he'd written about before, and you don't know if Carlin said them first or Mike right, said them so he, first. Right. Uh, there was one problem, uh, there was a long stretch of a paragraph from a book uh, about Earl um, uh, Long of Louisiana, former governor Earl Long, Huey okay. Long's brother. And uh, Liebling, I think, was the guy who wrote the book, and the paragraph was identical to what was in the book. Uh, Mike says that he had loved the book so much that the paragraph stuck in his mind. That is basically the warp and woof of it. Either it stuck so in his mind that he was able to repeat it verbatim, or he didn't. And that is about what it amounts to. The, the wow. rest of it, some jokes that Carlin has said, some references. Right, that everybody's so aware of. It's it like you're hiding. went on to the point, and I think the Globe simply felt, having had to fire Patricia Smith, who had been one of their writers, who had made up things and plagiarized significantly and demonstrably, they felt perhaps it's time they have to throw a little caucasoid meat yeah, right. uh, at the lions. And I think so they, 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 they tossed so, the Sometimes it's just bad timing. Very bad timing. In terms of where the pendulum is swinging. But, We've know, got about 40 seconds left quickly. Sure. Uh, I want to thank you very much. Thank also, you for having you know, me. For taking time out of your for arresting me. I know you're going to... You know, yeah. <laughs> my pleasure. Now, um, 30 seconds to aspiring uh, uh, folks in communications who want to become radio personalities. What do you tell someone who's sitting at home today who's maybe going to Emerson or, or looking to change a career? How, what's the first couple steps? One thing is do a lot of reading. Know what you're talking about. Be informed, not just in the technique of radio or TV or whatever, but have stuff, have content. I always tell my own students, you, you get the edge not just by being able to do a Chiron and knowing how to say your name and whatever the name of the station, but knowing material. And I urge a lot of reading. And then, of course, ultimately you wind up going to a small place, starting up, getting a reputation, and keep building right. so that you wind up in whatever kind of environment you want to live in, whether it's TV or writing or, or radio. And uh, I think a, a lot more people ought to go into radio but stay away from my hour. That's right. Well, David, that thank you. I can ask, okay? Thank you very much for thank your time. Thank you, Sheriff. Good to have you. Have and I want an opportunity to talk to you. This has been a great honor for me, personally, and, and you know, for all of us at Quincy Cable. Well, we'll be having you, of course, on the radio soon. Yeah, too. yeah you've been great. About, uh, Sheriff duties and so on. And I want, want to... Are you running for re-election this Yes, I'm not on the... I'm sorry. <coughs> no opposition on the... Uh, yeah. This year, which is it's great. A, so it's a democratic Six state, more years, right? hopefully. Exactly. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for joining us today with David Brednoy. It's been a great show, one of our best. And, uh, and please uh, continue to join us. Thank you.